when I sought the Lord for a, a message um, on Thursday, um, this is uh, what he um, uh, he spoke to me about, and um, the title of my message today is Religion versus Power. Religion versus Power. Um, for those of you who have um, paper Bibles, um, I, I know a lot of people use devices now, um, laptops and uh, phones and everything like this. Uh, if you if you take your Bible, please, um, and if you um, turn to Matthew's Gospel, chapter one, and then just turn back a page. Uh, this won't be possible for you, for you who, if you have an electronic device, obviously. <laughs> um, I just want to show you something graphically. So, Matthew chapter 1, and then turn back a page. Okay. What do you find? I'll show you in my Bible. We have blank pages. Mm -hmm. One of this is New Testament. Over the page we have the end of uh, Malachi, mm -hmm. the, the prophet Malachi. Um, so we have this period here. Okay. Now theologians call this the intertestamentary period. And us Protestants, we call this the silent period the silent period. This period is at least 400 years, maybe 420, but no less than 400 years, when God is entirely silent, is entirely silent, as regards words from prophets, from teachers, from signs, wonders, miracles, there is an absolute silence in this record. Now we know that the um, Israelite nation repeatedly uh, disobeyed God, broke his commandments, and, and it reached, reached such a state that they had to go into captivity. He warned them about this time and time again. He brought... Uh, Isaiah, he brought Jeremiah, he brought other prophets um, to warn them. <coughs> but he had already told them that these kind of things would happen if they disobeyed him. And eventually it got to such a state that he s sent them into captivity. And they went to Babylon as captives. Jerusalem was destroyed, the temple was destroyed, all that temple worship was destroyed and they were in Babylon for 70 years. Then after 70 years were fulfilled, according to scripture, according to what God had pro prophesied, um, he brought them back. Or the doors were opened uh, so that they could come back. Now, not everyone came back. A vast majority stayed where they were because they enjoyed that lifestyle. Mm -hmm. They were the reason for the exile in the first place, that body of Israelite people. But the ones who loved God, the ones who wanted God, the ones who had zeal for God, they came back. They came back with, um, uh, with a, a hunger and a thirst to rebuild what was lost, to rebuild Jerusalem, to rebuild the temple. And um, uh, under their leaders, they started to do this. Um, and one of the reasons that they went into captivity was their idolatry. They worshipped idols. And they had this as a repeated thing right back to the days of Moses, they had the golden calf. Then after that, they had the goat idols that they made and worshipped. 
So this was a constant thing throughout. And, and we, we even see about King Solomon when he grew old. And he had these uh, 700 foreign wives and, and um, uh, 300 concubines. that They led him astray. And he, he worshipped um, uh, Ashtoreth and, and Molech and, uh, and all these other foreign gods. They worshipped their idols. Now this was the wisest man on earth. He worshipped these idols because his heart was led astray from God. Um, God kept the kingdom with him, but it was with his son that things started to go bad. And um, I won't go into that history now. But what happened when Israel came back? Under the leadership, guidance, and preaching um, of Ezra, Israel no longer followed and worshipped idols, made idols, okay? But what happened was, um, so that's a, an ending of material idol worship. So they no longer had material things to worship. But from that period onwards, something crept in slowly and silently and it was a form of legalism um, which came about like I said slowly but it was very strong in establishing itself and um, we have the rise of these scribes and these Pharisees uh, who produced all of these extra rules and regulations. Um, and it was subtle, this. And it was very pernicious. And what happened in the end was the establishment of an idolatry of the letter. They worshipped the letter. And the letter was the letter of the law. That's the thing that they most highly prized, and they actually didn't worship God, but they worshipped the letter. They worshipped their own creation, the letter of the law. And um, this was a more deadly kind of idolatry because it looked like a true zeal for God and for righteousness. Now I'm going to take you into Matthew's Gospel here. We have this intertestamentary period. Okay. We have this silent period. Don't we? When there is just nothing. And then BAM! Here is John the Baptist. John. The prophet, the baptizer, he comes on the scene. And then, bam, Jesus Christ arrives on the scene out of silence. But what is established and firmly embedded for hundreds of years is this religion that Israel has. Israel is gripped by this deep Pharisaic and scribe-led religion. And they are in charge. Religion is deeply embedded in this nation. But John the Baptist comes. John the Baptizer, the prophet he is a wild man, according to what we read, living in the desert. And then Jesus Christ comes. We have his genealogy in Matthew 1. And then we have this, this baptism. And then being led into the, into the wilderness and 
and, and being coming back in the power of the Holy Spirit. So we see the start of something here. The start of something. There is now something happening which hasn't happened for hundreds of years. There is an appearing, a presence of power. Jesus was conceived by the Holy Spirit via the Virgin Mary. But then he went into the wilderness after being baptized. And what we are told is that he, after this 40 days and 40 nights of being tempted and, and overcoming, he came back in the power of the Holy Spirit. Now that's very, very, very important for us to notice. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 verse 6. The Apostle Paul tells us that when Jesus was resurrected, he appeared to 500 people. You can check it out if you like, it's there, 1 Corinthians 15, 6. He appeared to 500 people. A confirmation of his resurrection. And um, in the book of Acts, chapter 1, we have this episode of the disciples... They're still confused about this whole thing. We'll get into Matthew in a minute. Because we have something in Matthew that this is what I believe that the, uh, Jesus wants us to look at. In, Ma in, in the book of Acts, the disciples are still confused. And they ask um, Jesus, is it now that you're going to establish the kingdom of God? Is it now? They thought that Jesus had come to do some kind of political thing. They had missed some of the greatest indications of what was Jesus' actual mission. The reality of what he was doing. Remember the title of this message. Religion versus power. Okay. Jesus tells them that it's not for you to know the dates and times that the Father set by his own authority. And I've not come to do that, in other words. But he tells them to wait in Jerusalem for them to be clothed with what? With the Holy Spirit, with power. He tells them to wait. They have been trained with lots of training about the kingdom of God. They've had a go with uh, some of the things that Jesus did. And um, they've gone out and uh, come back rejoicing uh, that the demons submitted to them and they've, they've done all kinds of uh, signs and wonders. Um, they still didn't have it in their minds though. But Jesus told them to wait, wait, wait in Jerusalem until the time and you will be clothed by the Holy Spirit and you will have power. So they had knowledge, but they had to wait for power. Now, we are told in 1 Corinthians 15, 6, that 500, Jesus appeared to 500. Now, what are we told in the book of Acts, in chapter 1? We are told that there are 120. There are 120 in the upper room on the day of Pentecost. 120 minus 500. What's happened to the 380 people? They must have had something else that they thought was better. They weren't there. These people were not there. 380. We're left with 120. The 120 waited. And they had this experience of power. They were filled with the power of the Holy Spirit.
Let's have a look at a couple of scriptures. We're going to look at um, Matthew chapter 12. But I just want to just touch on two scriptures, okay? <clears throat> Matthew 14 verse 1 says this. At that time, Herod the Tetrarch heard about the fame of Jesus. Okay? Fame. At that time, Herod the Tetrarch heard about the fame of Jesus. Keep that in mind. Now, here's another one. 1 Kings chapter 10 verse 1. Right? 1 Kings chapter 10 verse 1. It talks about... this famous visit. 1 Kings chapter 10 verse 1. Now when the Queen of Sheba heard about the fame of Solomon. Keep that in your mind. So we have two scriptures there that talk about the fame. The fame of Solomon and the fame of Jesus. Right? Keep that in your mind. Just Make a note of it. Now we're going to look at something here. In this uh, quite long reading of Matthew chapter 12. Now, I don't like modern Bibles. In the way that they have these tiny little headings in sections. That try and, the, the, the translators or the the, uh, the, 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 the the printers, they put these nice little kind of helpful subheadings in the chapters. Chapters and verse, yeah, brilliant. We need those so that we can navigate and we can all be on the, the same chapter and the same uh, verse. But these little things are in there and they irritate me. No, they, they, they really irritate me because, for, for two reasons, um, they are, they are interpretations of what the person thinks is in that little section. Okay, that's one thing that irritates me. The second thing is they interrupt the flow of what the author is telling us or trying to tell us under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. There is a flow here of a narrative. And what the modern Bibles do is they split these things up into little chunks and they give them these little headings. Like in mine it says, Jesus is the Lord of the Sabbath, a man with a withered hand, blasphemy against the Holy Spirit, the sign of Jonah. These things to me are just not helpful in what the author is actually trying to uh, tell us about this whole narrative because what we have here is very important for us to understand about religion versus power okay so let me read <clears throat> I'm beginning at chapter 12 verse 1 now this is the English standard version so it might be slightly different from yours at that time, Jesus went through the grain fields on the Sabbath. His disciples were hungry, and they began to pluck ears of corn and to eat. But when the Pharisees saw it, now you can see straight away that it's not just the disciples. This is a, a large group of people, and Pharisees are there, right? Okay, sorry for the interruption, but I just want to paint, try and paint the picture in your mind about what's actually happening here. We have a large body of people and the Messiah, Jesus, is in the midst of them. Okay? And they're, they're making some kind of progress and they're going through this field, right? But when the Pharisees saw it, this is verse 2, they said to him, Look, your disciples are doing what is not lawful on the Sabbath. And he said to them, have you not read what David did when he was hungry and those who were with him, how he entered the house of God 
and ate the bread of the presence, which is not lawful for him to eat, nor for those who are with him, but only for the priests. Or have you not read in the law how on the Sabbath the priests in the temple profane the Sabbath and are guiltless? I tell you, something greater than the temple is here. And if you had known what this means, I desire mercy, not sacrifice, you would not have condemned the guiltless, for the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. He went on from there and entered their synagogue. And a man was there with a withered hand. And they asked him, Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath? So that they might accuse him. And he said to them, Which one of you has a sheep, and if it falls into a pit on the Sabbath, will not take hold of it and lift it out? Of how much more value is a man than a sheep? So it is lawful to do good on the Sabbath. Then he said to the man, Stretch out your hand. And the man stretched it out, and it was restored healthily like the other. But the Pharisees went out and conspired against him how to destroy him. Jesus, aware of this, withdrew from there. And many followed him, and he healed them all, and ordered them not to make him known. This was to fulfil what was spoken by the prophet Isaiah. This is Isaiah 42, verses 1 to 4. Behold, my servant whom I have chosen, my beloved with whom my soul is well pleased, I will put my spirit upon him, and he will proclaim justice to the Gentiles. He will not quarrel or cry aloud, nor will anyone hear his voice in the streets. A bruised reed he will not break, nor a smouldering wick he will not quench, until he brings justice to victory. And in his name the Gentiles will hope. Then a demon present a oppressed man who was blind and mute was brought to him and he healed him so that the man spoke and saw and the people were amazed and said can this be the son of David but when the Pharisees heard it they said it is only by Beelzebub the prince of demons that this man casts out demons knowing their thoughts he said to them every kingdom divided against itself is laid waste, and no city or house divided against itself will stand. And if Satan casts out Satan, he is divided against himself. How then will his kingdom stand? And if I cast out de demons by Beelzebub, by whom do your sons cast them out? Therefore they will be your judges. But if it is by the Spirit of God that I cast out demons, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. Or how can, a man, or how can someone enter a strong man's house and plunder his goods, unless he first binds the strong man? Then indeed he may plunder his house. Whoever is not with me, sorry, whoever is not against me, Sorry, whoever is not with me is against me, and whoever does not gather with me scatters. Therefore I tell you, every sin and blasphemy will be forgiven. But blasphemy against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven. And whoever speaks a word against the Son of Man will be forgiven. But whoever speaks against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven, even in this age or in the age to come. Either make a tr tree good and its fruit is good, or make a tree bad and its fruit bad. For the tree is known by its fruit. You brood of vipers, how can you speak good when you are evil? For out of the abundance of the heart the mouth speaks. The good person out of the good treasure brings forth good. And the evil person out of his evil treasure brings forth evil. 
I tell you, on the day of, day of judgment, people will give account for every careless word they speak. For by your words you will be justified, and by your words you will be condemned. Then some of the scribes and Pharisees answered him, saying, Teacher, we wish to see a sign from you. But he answered them, An evil and adulterous generation seeks for a sign, but no sign will be given to it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. For just as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. The men of Nineveh will rise up at the judgment with this generation and condemn it, for they repented at the preaching of Jonah, and behold, something greater than Jonah is here. The Queen of the South will rise up at the judgment with this generation and condemn it, for she came from the ends of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon. And behold, something greater than Solomon is here. When the unclean spirit has gone from a person, it passes through waterless places seeking rest, but finds none. Then it says, I will return to my house from which I came. And when it comes, it finds the house empty, swept, and put in order. Then it goes and brings with it seven more other spirits, even more evil than itself. And they enter and dwell there. And the last state of that person is worse than the first. So also will it be with this evil generation. This narrative is one complete narrative that the author is trying to demonstrate to us something. I know in our modern Bibles it's split up into these little chunks, but there is something here we really, really need to see. Now, he quoted um, 1 Samuel 21.6, this episode where, um, where um, King David had been anointed king, but he was fleeing for his life. And um, uh, some men with him. And he, he stopped at uh, the, the, the house of God and uh, he, he ate this showbread. The showbread was put out every day. Um, and um, at the end of the day, uh, it was eaten by the, the priests. Okay, and then fresh bread was put there. So, he ate that. And then, um, so, so Jesus was saying there was an expedient thing there that was necessary. Because David was anointed king. So we have something here where Jesus is emphasising something different than the rigid um, adoption of the law that the, that the Pharisees and scribes had. And remember what they did. They had the law of Moses, the Levitical law and the ceremonial law. And then they built around it all of their other things that they, um, they had from the time of Ezra onwards. They had a hundreds and hundreds of laws. I mean, Jesus spoke to them, we won't have time to go into them uh, now, but he, there was all things about tithing and, and, and getting around um, uh, the law by, by saying, no, if, if we do this, we don't have to do that for you. Um, he was talking about um, honouring father and mother. So, so, The Pharisees and the, the scribes fail to recognise the things even in the law, even in the word that they worship. Okay? They fail to see things. Yet they examine this word day in, day out. 
They worship this word. They worship the word more than God. They worship their other books more than God. But they fail to see some things which are just absolutely plain. Okay? Now, what, what about the Sabbath? What about this Sabbath thing? They challenge Jesus directly here about the Sabbath. Is it lawful to do good on the Sabbath? And Jesus just tells them a very practical kind of illustration. Well, if you have a sheep and it falls into a well, well, you pull it out. Now, that's not lawful according to their, law, their lawful practice. Because it's work. And they weren't allowed to work on the Sabbath. I mean, even today, uh, Orthodox Jews who are very uh, conscientious, they have, they have timers on their light switches. So that they don't, on the Sabbath, they don't have to turn on a light switch. <laughs> the thing turns on automatically. <coughs> they cook the day before. So that, they, I, mean, it, I mean, they go to ridiculous lengths. To, to, to comply with these things. But they, they, they missed some basic things. Look at this. If you go to Joshua chapter 6, right? Joshua chapter 6 is a really, really on the surface thing that you can't miss, but you can miss. Right? God said, the Sabbath, you must rest. Every day you can work. But on the Sabbath you must rest. You go, you see this, Joshua chapter to chapter 6, verse 15. What happens on that day? Here they are. They've gone into the promised land. And they are confronted with Jericho. And God has given them specific instructions. God has given them. This isn't uh, human battle or siege tactics. God has told them to do specific things about how they are going to conquer this um, city, the first city that they've encountered. It's a highly walled city, uh, mm -hmm. and he's told them, uh, he's told them ab uh, about uh, uh, um, what they're meant to do. And here we are, here we are Josh Joshua chapter 6, verse 15, what happens? This is the what? Is, is this the, the first day, the second day, the third day, the fourth day, the fifth day, the sixth day? This is the Sabbath. This is the Sabbath. They're not resting. They're going into battle. They're not complying with the law. God has told them something. And you see... You see, the Pharisees and the, uh, the scribes uh, and the Sadducees, they, they miss this kind of thing. They don't see it. It is lawful to do good on the Sabbath. Jesus does this miracle in front of them. And what happens? What is their response? Their response to this miracle is this chapter 12 verse 14 but the Pharisees went out and conspired how they might destroy him what, why do you think that is here's someone who is doing good and demonstrating something on the Sabbath he's told them this little story, yeah, if a sheep falls, if you have a sheep and it falls in there, it's natural. You'll just, you'll pull it out. That's work. You'll break the Sabbath according to your rules. So it is good to do good on the Sabbath. Isn't, isn't a man worth more than a sheep? And then he proves it. And how does he prove it? Not with religion, but with a work of power with the work of power. This chapter, and many others, but this chapter in particular, is a very good chapter that, that the, the author, under the power and inspiration of the Holy Spirit, is trying to demonstrate to us something. 
that there is something here going on. There is religion and there is power. There is religion and there is power. The reason these Pharisees in chapter, in verse 14, went out and conspired to destroy him was because this work that he just done could not be dis could not be dismissed and it was a direct confrontation with their religious power they had religious power they gripped the nation they controlled the people with their religion and their religious power now here was John the Baptist come I mean John the Baptist is is, is, his ministry is now handed over he's, he, he, is, he is, is given over he, he has said oh, I must really decrease and he must increase Jesus is on the scene Jesus has returned full of power full of power and the power is the power of God the Holy Spirit God the Holy Spirit is the empowerer of the something, the something. Now you notice this, verse 6, I tell you, Jesus says, something greater than the temple is here. Okay, right, we can accept that, that sounds reasonable. But then you go to, um, you go to verse um, 41, and he says this. The men of Nineveh will rise up at the judgment with this generation and condemn it. For they repented at the preaching of Joseph, uh, uh, at Jonah. And behold, something greater than Jonah is here. Now that sounds slightly odd, doesn't it? Because remember what I said about to keep in your minds about the fame. The fame, of, the fame of Jesus came to um, Herod's hearing. He heard about the fame of Jesus. Mm. And how he linked that back to that other one with the fame of Solomon came to the hearing of the Queen of Sheba. So she went to visit. That's a someone. The fame of Jesus. Jesus is someone. And the fame of Solomon... Solomon is a someone, isn't, isn't that right? That's just normal grammar, okay? But we have here something. And behold, something greater than Jonah is here. And then the verse carries on, verse 42. The queen of the south will rise up at the judgment with this generation and condemn it. For she, was from the, for she came from the ends of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon. And behold, something greater than Solomon is here. What is something? What is a something? What did Jesus bring? What did Jesus announce? He announced the kingdom of God is at hand. The kingdom of God is at hand. Something is the kingdom. Now if we, if we scroll back a little bit. We look at this demonstration of power. This isn't religion. This is power. This is, this is religion versus power. Here we have a, religion, a demonstration of power. Verse 22. I hope you, you're with me with this. <laughs> Verse 22, then a demon oppressed man was, who was blind and mute was brought to him and he healed him. So that the man spoke and saw. And the, all the people were amazed. These are the common people. They were amazed. And they said, can this be the son of David? They're all waiting for the Messiah. Can this be him? But when the Pharisees heard him, the people in power, the people with religion, the people that gripped and ruled 
under the Romans, but they were the people who had the hearts and minds of the people. They were the people in charge of the religious ordinances that told people what they could and couldn't do. Okay? But when the Pharisees heard it, they said, it is only by Beelzebub, the prince of demons, that this man casts out demons. Knowing their thoughts, he, Jesus, said to them, Every kingdom divided against itself is laid waste, and no city or house divided against itself will stand. And if Satan casts out Satan, he is divided against himself. How then will his kingdom stand? And if I cast out demons by Beelzebub, by whom do your sons cast them out? Therefore they will be your judges. Verse 28, very, very important verse. But if it is by the Spirit of God that I cast out demons, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. That is the something. The something is the kingdom of God. Jesus has made and opened the kingdom of God. And this is the reason why in verse 14 they conspired how to destroy him because some other kingdom has come Amen. some other kingdom has come okay and the empower of that kingdom is in this verse verse 28 but if it is by the spirit of god that i cast out demons then the kingdom of god has come upon you that is the something something greater then the temple is here. Something greater than Jonah is here. Something greater than Solomon is here. The kingdom of God is here. And the Holy Spirit is the empowerer of the kingdom. Because Jesus, yes, born of a virgin by the power of the Holy Spirit. But didn't start his ministry in power until he came back from the temptation the 40 days and 40 nights in the wilderness he came back in power and the power of the Holy Spirit was the power of the kingdom that he brought with him mm -hmm. now this was after 400 years of religion deeply ingrained and deeply gripping a nation he is now in this confrontation, bringing a different kingdom. Their kingdom is being challenged. Their kingdom is being demonstrated to be false. Because works of power are being seen. Right? All they have is religion. All they have is rules, regulations, rituals, all of that. Rigidity. There's nothing fluid about this. There's nothing um, new. This has been in place for hundreds of years. The people are engrossed by this. They are frozen. And Jesus comes along. The kingdom comes along. Amen. Jesus demonstrates to these people but if it is by the spirit of God right so this is why he goes on to talk about this thing here he says about this he does this little demonstration here it's a little mind picture and I know some people have taken this and, and they've made a kind of religious ordinance uh, out of it themselves. That you can't cast out demons until you bind them and, and all kinds of things like that. Well, okay, if that works for you, fine. But Jesus, immediately after saying this, paints a little mind picture for them. In verse 29. Or how can someone enter a strong man's house and plunder his goods unless he first binds the strong man mm. then indeed he may plunder his house mm. right 
What he's saying is, listen, my kingdom, the power of the Holy Spirit, is greater and stronger than what you have had for all of these hundreds of years. Amen. This thing that I am bringing, this thing that you are, you are now able to enter, is so powerful, it will just bind up anything you think and plunder those things that are captive. I can now plunder you, Jesus is saying, because of the power of the Holy Spirit. Now, that's why he goes on to talk about this thing about the sin against the Holy Spirit. Because the Holy Spirit is the empowerer of the kingdom. You, you sin against the Holy Spirit. He says, look, sins against me, sins of blasphemies against me, they can be forgiven. That's not a problem. But you blaspheme, you sin against the Holy Spirit. You're sinning against someone who is not able to, uh, he is not able to um, defend himself. Okay? And you are sinning against the kingdom of God. You're sinning against the kingdom of God. These are unforgivable sins. Because if you sin against God's kingdom, how, what else is there for you? He says here in verse 32, And whoever speaks a word against the Son of Man will be forgiven, but whoever speaks against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven. He is giving these people a real impression of the preciousness and authority of the Holy Spirit. Why? Because they've just said to him, Oh, it's by Satan. It's by Satan that you're doing this. Right? And he's just told them, No, if a kingdom is divided against itself, it will fail. That is impossible. They've just, they've just said all this. They've said, no, it's by Satan. He's telling them, look, you do not call the Holy Spirit Satan. You do not get into that, because that is an unforgivable area. You must take the Holy Spirit as absolutely sacred. Absolutely sacred. It's a dire, dire warning to these religious people. Remember the scene that they're in. They are trapped and frozen in this world of religiosity. And Jesus has come along with power. The power of the kingdom. Something real. What they have is not real. They, are, they have unreality. They have a religion which is ossified, which is stilted, which is stuck, which never goes anywhere. That's why religions on earth today are like that. They go through their ritual cycles over and 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 over again. Year after year, decade after decade, century after century, and there's no change. There's nothing for the people. There's no freedom. There's no power. There's no joy. There is just practice. 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 Jesus has come and challenged that whole thing. He's challenged and he's tearing down this power base that these Pharisees and Sadducees and, and scribes have set up over these years. He's tearing them apart and they hate him for it. They want to kill him. But it's all about God. The Holy Spirit. And the kingdom of God that's come. That's why religion hates power. Religion hates the power of God. Why? Because the power of God is all about freedom. It's all about liberty. It's change. It's fluid. There is no religiosity involved. There is no ritual, ritual 
Cycle, cycle, cycle. That has to be obeyed in it. If that is the case, then you do not have the kingdom of God. What you have is religion. And unfortunately, we've seen this with movements of God in the past. They have become ossified. In other words, a medical term that the bone that grows grows by a it grows there's a cartilage part. Once that cartilage part becomes ossified, the bone can't grow anymore. It's stuck. That's what's happened to some great movements in the past. Where God was moving. The kingdom was moving. And now they're just religion. And they're still practicing. But there's no power involved. This is a great warning. This chapter is a great warning to us all. When we think about what we do. We must be really conscious of what Jesus said to the disciples in the Garden of Gethsemane. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Watch and pray, therefore. Watch. We have to watch. We have to watch that we don't become religious. Because... If we become religious, we lose power. Mm. We become like the Pharisees. We become like these religious people. They wanted to kill Jesus. They killed him in the end. It was part of the God's plan. But they were the ones. Mm. And what does he say to them in verse 33? I mean, is it, this is all about a clash here of kingdoms and is ripping them apart is tearing them apart with his words verse 33 either make a tree good and its fruit is good or make a tree bad and its fruit is bad for a tree is is known by its fruit you brood of vipers exclamation mark in my bible isn't that exactly the same words that john the baptist said to them um in, uh, where is it? In, oh, it, it's in Matthew. Yeah, Matthew chapter 3, um, verse 7. Here is John baptizing. John the baptizer, prophet John, is arisen after 400 years of silence. People are going out to him, repenting of their sins. And being baptised. And what does John say when he sees these Pharisees and Sadducees? What, does, what phrase does he use? Ha! He says to them, when, verse 7, when he saw many Pharisees and Sadducees coming to his baptism, he said to them, you brood of vipers! Same words. You brood of vipers. Jesus is ripping this kingdom apart and demonstrating the power of the Holy Spirit. See, if we, if we turn over a couple of uh, pages to um, chapter 15, we have again this clash. Verses 1 to 9. Then the Pharisees came to Jesus from Jerusalem and said, why do your disciples break the tradition of the elders? See, this is what they had, the tradition of the elders. It was man, layer upon layer upon layer upon layer of rules and regulations, 
tradition. It was the thing of their nation. It's all part of them. And he's, they, they, oh, they say to him, what, in verse 2, Why do your disciples break the tradition of the elders? For they do not wash their hands when they eat. He answered them, And why do you break the commandments of God? For the sake of your tradition. For God commanded, honour your father and mother, and whoever reviles father and mother must surely die. But you say, if anyone tells his father or his mother, what you would have gained from me is given to God. He need not honour his father. So for the sake of your tradition, you have made void the word of God. You hypocrites! Exclamation mark in my Bible. Well did Isaiah prophesy of you when he said, This people honours me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. In vain. Listen to this. This is um, th this is Jesus quoting Isaiah twenty nine thirteen. Okay. In vain do they worship me. Wow. Imagine that. These people are so zealous for God, so they think. But God's opinion of them, Jesus' opinion of them, Jesus is quoting. Isaiah 600 years ago, the, the prophecy. Jesus is saying this, In vain do they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. And then he goes on to talk, to talk about this whole thing about what goes into a a person doesn't defile a person because it just goes into their elementary tract and out. Um, but what defiles a person is what comes out of a person. Um, for out of the overflow of their mouth. Um, uh, and then he goes on to tell, he, he, he's got this wider audience with him, this wider congregation. In verse 14 he says, Let them alone. They are blind guides. And the blind lead the blind. Both will fall into a pit. And um, <laughs> they've already had explanation from, from Jesus, the, the, his disciples, okay? He's already explained some parables to them, what they mean. And, and <laughs> the, in verse 15 of this same chapter, Peter, but Peter says to him, explain the parable to us. And he said, are you so also still without understanding? Right? That continues. They see all this clash of kingdoms. They see Jesus tearing down the religion. They see the Holy Spirit operating, the kingdom operating, operating, operating. And that they still don't get it. Even on the, uh, even in Acts chapter 1, the Jesus has risen from the dead. They're still asking these dumb questions, these dumb political questions. And it's nothing to do with that. It's about power. Jesus tells them, no, go and go to Jerusalem. Stay there. Abide there. Wait there. You will be clothed with power. You need the same thing that I operated in. You, you are going to be the bringers of the kingdom. I was the bringer of the kingdom. The kingdom's already been there, but I opened the doors. Okay, you're going to do that, but you can't do it without power. So go and wait and abide. And 380 didn't bother. They went off and thought, saw, thought something else was more important. But 120 did. And they got baptised in the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost. And, the, and Peter stood up and preached. And the, the whole kingdom of 
of God, the church just rolled out and conquered the whole earth. So what's the point of all of this? Right? What's the point of this Matthew chapter 12? Well, let me tell you, there is a vast and eternal difference between religion and the power of the kingdom of God. Religion is absolutely dead and absolutely useless. Religion hates the power of the kingdom. You know, Pentecostals and Charismatics, when, when there was the Azusa Street Revival, um, those people got a hard time. They had a hard time when they started manifesting, speaking in tongues and, and doing all kinds of signs and wonders and miracles. The same with the Charismatics. They got a hard time from the wider body of Christ, the religious people, because they were manifesting power and under, they were misunderstood. But this is, this is reality in chapter 12. Jesus tells us the kingdom of God is here. It operates by the power of the Holy Spirit and you need that. He demonstrates it time and time and time again. So that's one of the things. Religion is dead. Religion is useless. Religion will not get you anywhere at all. And if you think you're going to go to heaven because you're religious... Forget about it. Religion will not get you into heaven. Your religious rituals and practices, if you do them for years and years and decades and decades, they will get you nowhere near heaven. You need Jesus Christ and his kingdom. That's the only way into heaven. Jesus said it himself. No man comes to the Father except by me. That's why he came. And he came with a demonstration of the kingdom. And the demonstration of the kingdom is power. What does it say in 1 Corinthians chapter 4 verse 20? And the word that is very, very important there is the word consist. What does that word mean, consist? Consist. It, this consists of something, doesn't it? Consist. This, this, this thing here consists of something, doesn't it? It's made of something, isn't it? This, these clothes consist of something. They are actual. They are, they are present. This button consists of something. It consists of plastic. So what does 1 Corinthians chapter um, 4 verse 20 say about the kingdom of God? It consists of something. Not of. See? It's not what the Pharisees, Sadducees and and the scribes thought it was all about. They thought the kingdom of God consisted of words. They worshipped the words. It consists of power. So that's another thing. And who, does, who, who has the kingdom? Whoever has the Holy Spirit. Something greater is here. You have the something because you have the someone. You are of the kingdom because you have the someone. You have God the Holy Spirit. Therefore, something consists inside you that is of another place, 
That's why Jesus said three times in John's Gospel that you are not of this world. Because you have someone inside you that is the something, that powers the something. Therefore, we are of the kingdom. Therefore, we have the power. Therefore, we are not religious. We are not bound by rules and regulations and rituals. We, I mean, we had a demonstration of this this morning in our service. We sing choruses, we sing songs, we sing worship. Yes, we do that. We pray. Yes, we do that. But what happened this morning was different to what happened last week. We all got up and prayed with each other. We're all priests. We all prayed with each other. Mm. I've got this thing on here because I've been ordained. Okay, I'm a teacher. It's, it's, my, my, it's my office to prepare the saints for works of, of ministry. All right? But this doesn't mean that I'm the only one that gets up and prays. We all did it, didn't we, this morning? Amen. I mean, it was a holy huddle. Mm. It was a crazy kind of time. Now that is a demonstration of the kingdom, isn't it? Amen. It's not religious formality. Amen. We don't have books that we pray from and read the same thing every day. Every day. Every day. Every day. Every day. Every day. How boring is religion, isn't it? Isn't religion dead and boring? Thank God. For the kingdom of God. Amen. Thank God for the Holy Spirit in us. Mm. Who gives us his freshness. His difference. He is so creative. Mm. Oh if we sang the same song every week. Some churches you just think. Oh. Uh, how do you carry on week by week? <laughs> oh, dear dear dear. I mean, I won't mention any denominations <laughs> because it's too controversial, but oh, please, let the kingdom come. Mm. Let the kingdom back in. Amen. Let the God, the Holy Spirit, come back mm. and have his way. Mm. Let him come back and inhabit his place. Mm. And we sang that thing this morning, didn't we? Mm. About all well, your presence here. Mm. We welcome your presence. Mm. Yes! Mm. Mm. We need God, the Holy Spirit, to empower mm. the kingdom. Mm. Jesus said it himself, just there. But if it is by the Spirit of God that I cast out demons. Mm. He, he's not saying that it, it's him casting out the demons. Mm. Notice the wording. It's very important that you notice the wording. Mm. Okay? He didn't say it's by me that casts out the demons. He says it's by the Spirit of God. Mm. Okay? Mm. That's the power. Mm. That's the power. That's mm. why he only ministered after he came mm. back from his 40 days and 40 nights in the mm. wilderness. Mm. He had to have the power. And the power comes from God the Holy Spirit. Mm. And you have God the Holy Spirit. Therefore you have the power. Mm. You have the kingdom. So, to just sum up, we must watch that we don't become religious, okay, we must guard against that, because we must never have this said against us, that uh, this people honours me with their lips, with their hearts are far, far from me. In vain, we never, ever, never, ever want to worship the Lord in vain. Mm -hmm. I am sure there are churches and denominations now that are so deadened in religion that they, this could be said of them, that they worship the Lord in vain. Mm -hmm. They go there and go through their rituals. And not only in Christian denominations, I mean, I'm talking about all kind of world religions. They believe in God or some kind of God or some kind of deity. And they have rituals and uh, routines that they go through. And they think they're making a connection. 
and they think they're doing it right. But this is all, this is all in vain. Mm. Teaching as doctrines the commands of men. Things that men have made up and thought up. And things that demons worship. Demons. So we must be encouraged by this chapter 12. Okay? We must be encouraged by what we see Jesus doing with this religion. With this deeply embedded and powerful religion of the Pharisees and Sadducees. He is shredding it. He is tearing it apart, seam by seam, by demonstrations of his power. And that's what we see throughout these Gospels. And then further into the uh, book of Acts. And then it spreads out and we see it in the, in the, in the, in the Apostles' letters. Demonstrations of power. That's what we see. And that's what we... We get really encouraged by this chapter 12. I was certainly encouraged by it when, when Jesus gave me this on Thursday. This, this clash of kingdoms and his destruction of it. His tearing apart of this massive edifice, this castle built on religion. He just broke it apart by works of power, works of the Holy Spirit. And that Holy Spirit has never changed. And you have him the same today. You have him. That's why we were able to go around praying for each other this morning. We were praying for each other in the spirit with the kingdom of God. It's a powerful thing that we do. I mean, what is there here? Maybe 12, half of the 12 people here? There was only 12, there was only 120 people on the day of Pentecost. And Jesus only handpicked 12 people. To be his apostles. That's all he needed. Because the kingdom of God. Is empowered by God the Holy Spirit. And we have him. We have him. So therefore let us be encouraged. And let us not ever, ever, ever go down the route of becoming religious. And stuck in religion. We must guard against it. In Jesus name. Amen. 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 Amen.